All right, let's talk about a topic that is absolutely guaranteed to come up if you're prepping for an exam like the CSI or NET, eukaryotic transcription. It's this incredibly complex, super-regulated process that basically decides which of our thousands of genes get switched on or off at any given moment. Today, we're going to break down exactly how these genetic gatekeepers do their job step-by-step. Step. So, here's our game plan. First, we'll get a handle on why this process is so much trickier in eukaryotes. Then, we'll watch the cell assemble this amazing transcription machine piece by piece. After that, we'll see how it gets the green light to actually start, how it knows when to stop, and finally, we'll look at the finishing touches that turn a raw piece of RNA into a functional message. Okay, let's dive right in. The very first thing you have to grasp is that a complex eukaryotic cell, like one of ours, needs a much, much more sophisticated system to control its genes than a simple bacterium does. It's a system that's built from the ground up for precision, regulation, and, well, complexity. And this slide really lays out the big differences perfectly. See, in prokaryotes, it's all about speed and efficiency. You've got one RNA polymerase and a simple little protein called the sigma factor to find the starting line. But eukaryotes, they go for specialization. They have three different polymerases, and we're going to focus on RNA polymerase 2, the one that makes all of our protein coding genes. And instead of that one sigma factor, Paul 2 needs an entire crew of proteins, the general transcription factors, or GTFs, just to show it where to go. So this brings us to a huge central problem. RNA polymerase 2 is this incredibly powerful enzyme, but it has a major weakness. It's basically blind. It cannot recognize the promoter sequence on the DNA all by itself. So how does it possibly get to the right spot to start making RNA? Well, the answer lies with its guides, that team of general transcription factors. So how does this whole machine get built? We're now zooming right in on the genes promoter, ready to watch the step-by-step -step construction of this elegant piece of molecular machinery called the pre-initiation complex. And believe me, getting this part right is the absolute foundation of all transcription. The whole process kicks off at a specific little sequence in the DNA called the Tata box. You can seriously think of this as a big neon sign on the DNA highway that's flashing assemble here. It's a highly conserved sequence and finding it is the very, very first step in getting transcription started. Now, the key thing to remember is that this assembly isn't random. It's incredibly sequential and precise. It all begins when the big TFID complex lands on the Tata box, acting like an anchor. Then TFIA and B show up to stabilize everything. Next, TFIF comes in, acting as an escort for the star of the show, RNA polymerase 2. And finally, TFIE and H join the party, completing what we call the pre-initiation complex. It's like a perfectly ordered construction project. Let's just zoom in for a second on that first factor, TFIID, because it is so incredibly important. Inside it is a key subunit called TBP, or the Tata Binding Protein. Now, when TBP grabs onto that Tata box, it doesn't just sit there. It physically bends the DNA, kinking it significantly. This bend is a huge deal. It acts as a structural landmark, a distortion in the DNA that basically screams, hey, everyone else, get over here, to all the other factors. So, we have our machine, fully built and sitting on the launch pad, but it's just sitting there. It's dormant. This next phase, which we call promoter escape, is all about igniting the engine and getting that RNA polymerase 2 to finally start moving and making some RNA. You know, this stalled state is actually a critical checkpoint for the cell. Think of it like a car's engine, just idling. At this very moment, other proteins like activators or repressors can come in and either hit the gas or slam on the brakes. This gives the cell one final chance to decide, based on everything happening inside it, whether this gene really should be turned on before it commits a ton of energy to the process. And the hero of this whole stage is a factor called TFIIH. Now for your exams, you absolutely have to know its two critical functions. First, it has helicase activity. That means it uses energy from ATP to unwind and separate the two DNA strands, creating a little transcription bubble. Second, and just as important, it has kinase activity. This means it adds phosphate groups onto the long flexible tail of RNA polymerase II, a part we call the C-terminal domain, or CTD. And that phosphorylation, that simple act of adding phosphates, is the ultimate trigger. It's the green light. It causes a major change in the polymerase shape that breaks its connections to the promoter, allowing it to finally escape and start chugging down the gene, making RNA. This right here is the point of no return. 
All right, so our polymerase has been moving down the gene, elongating the RNA chain. But how does it know when to stop? Well, in eukaryotes, termination isn't just about hitting a stop sign. It's a really intricate process that's actually connected to preparing the new RNA molecule for its future job. Now, here's a key concept to understand, something they love to ask about on exams. The signal to stop isn't really a stop sign for the polymerase itself. Instead, the polymerase transcribes a specific sequence into the RNA, this polyadenylation signal, AAUAAA. This sequence is a message, but it's not for the polymerase. It's for other proteins, telling them, hey, the end is coming up, get ready to process this transcript. And in this beautifully efficient system, the proteins needed for termination have actually been hitching a ride on the polymerase's phosphorylated CT detail the entire time. So as soon as that AAUUA signal sequence pops out of the polymerase, two key factors you see here, CPSF and CSF, literally jump off the tail and grab onto that newly made RNA. Okay, with those recognition factors locked onto the RNA, the final steps can finally happen. This brand new RNA molecule is about to be cut free and given a crucial modification that's essential for its survival. CPSF and CSF now call in for backup. They recruit other proteins, including an endonucleus, which is basically an enzyme that cuts RNA. It's like a pair of molecular scissors. It finds a specific spot just downstream of that AAUAA signal and snip. It cuts the RNA transcript clean in two, setting the main body of our pre-mRNA free. Now, the moment that cut happens, this amazing enzyme called poly-A polymerase, or PAP, jumps into action. And what makes PAP so unique, so special, is that unlike every other polymerase we've talked about, it doesn't need a template. It just grabs adenine building blocks from the cell and starts adding them, one after another, onto that freshly cut 3' end. And we're not talking about just a few. PAP adds a long, protective tail of about 200 to 250 adenine nucleotides. This poly-A tail isn't just decoration, it's absolutely vital. It acts like a shield, protecting the mRNA from being chewed up by enzymes in the cell, and it's also critical for getting it exported out of the nucleus. So, why all this fuss about adding a cap and a tail? Well, this chart says it all. An mRNA that has its 5' prime cap and its 3' prime poly-A tail is super stable. But if you take those away, its lifespan just plummets. Without these protective ends, that precious genetic message would be destroyed long before it ever had a chance to be turned into a protein. So, after all that work, here's what we've built. A pre-mRNA molecule. It's protected on one end by a 5' prime cap and on the other by a long 3' prime poly-A tail. And sandwiched in the middle is the entire genetic message copied from the DNA which includes both the useful bits, the exons, and the non-coding interruptions, the introns. It's now packaged and ready for its final editing step. We've successfully taken a gene and transcribed it from start to finish, creating a protected pre-mRNA. But the story isn't over yet. This molecule is still full of those interrupting sequences, the introns, that have to be removed. So the big question now is, how does the cell know exactly where the introns end and the exons begin? How does it cut them out so precisely? Well, that is a deep dive into the fascinating world of RNA splicing, and it's a story for a next explainer.